Welcome to the future talks on how to prevent the next pandemic. Good afternoon. Thank you to everyone for virtually attending this special event. Welcome to what I believe will be an engaging and crucial debate on preventing the next pandemic. In the lead up to the World Health Summit, we would like to discuss the role and impact of pandemic prevention on our collective well-being. By now, it is clear to all decision makers that this global crisis requires a global response. What is not yet agreed upon is that our global response cannot only focus on how we prepare for the next pandemic, it must be about how we prevent it together. With the climate crisis, biodiversity loss and animal exploitation, the need for fundamental and transformational societal change has never been more urgent. We must acknowledge that we are living in an era of pandemics. It is time for reflection, responsibility and realignment if we are not to repeat the mistakes of COVID-19. Over the past 18 months, we've asked ourselves just how a virus that emerged in one animal could travel from species to species, host to host, continent to continent. How the ripples of one action completely changed everyday life as we knew it and forced a global lockdown. Yet, for many experts, it was not a question if it would happen, but when. Three out of four infectious diseases are of zoonotic or animal origin. SARS, MERS, Ebola, Zika and COVID-19 are all zoonotic. Zoonoses are a symptom of a critical imbalance between humans, animals and nature. They demonstrate how vulnerable we become when that balance is off. But they also show how connected our well-being is to that of animals and nature. Over the past 18 months, we have seen how our dysfunctional relationship to animals and nature had a significant cost on human society, where there has been untold misery and misfortune. We have also seen that if we want to prevent such outbreaks, we need to remedy the root causes. Anything less is only laying the ground for the next pandemic. We need to recognize that we, as humans, can only thrive if we care for animals and the planet. We cannot continue with business as usual. We need to act immediately. Time is not on our side and technology and preparedness alone wouldn't be the cure. So, what comes next? When primary forests are cleared to expand intensive farming, wild habitats are destroyed and biodiversity is decimated. This leads to pathogens in wild animals increasing and evolving faster, which mutate quicker and in the end jump to humans as in the case of the new coronavirus. When cats and dogs are slaughtered for their meat and when wild animals are traded in markets, humans find themselves exposed to some of the most dangerous pathogens. And who would have thought that fur farms where minks and foxes and so many other animals are skinned for their fur would be the breeding ground for COVID-19 mutations that would reinfect humans? It is sobering that it took a pandemic for everyone to understand how scientists have warned us about and what was always plain to see. When animals suffer, we suffer. We stand at a crossroad right now. In four days, the global health community and leaders will meet at the World Health Summit to address the most pressing health issues and outline path forward. This is an ideal opportunity to chart a new direction. The key questions that we need to answer post-pandemic are still the ones we asked before. What kind of society do we want to be? What kind of future will we leave to future generations? What priorities do we set? But the wider question has to be, how can this be done at the political level? What are the necessary political measures that need to be taken? The four pause future study will be published tomorrow. It includes valuable insights on likely versus necessary pathways beyond this pandemic for 29 renowned experts. Their disciplines include virology, veterinary medicine, agriculture, climate, economy, law and philosophy. The study underscores 
that health should be addressed in a more holistic and interdisciplinary way. And that if we make animal welfare a central part of pandemic prevention plans, the risk of the next pandemic breaking out will decrease. It also highlights that when high level of better animal welfare are implemented and regulated, all aspects of human life, well-being, the economy and the environment are better off. While this is a moral and health issue at its core, it makes economic sense as well. So let me conclude by saying that a global pandemic strategy must ensure that prevention is its very core. But prevention cannot exist without animal welfare. This is at the heart of what we do at Four Paws, so we know full well what opportunities must be seized at this critical moment. I'm excited for the discussion to now begin. Please enjoy what I'm sure will be an illuminating next 45 minutes. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Dr. Sarah Madan. Um, I serve as the Senior Director of the System-Wide Special Pathogens Program uh, at a very large healthcare system in New York City. I'm also part of the public health response and it's a pleasure to join you all today and discuss the important topics of uh, the animal and the human interaction, our environment and how we need to ensure that we're better prepared and preventing uh, and preparing for the, the next outbreak that we will most definitely see. Okay, hello. A very warm welcome to everybody. And thank you, Joseph, for this remarkable keynote. Just a quick test note. Do you see me on screen? Because I don't see myself on the TV screen. Um, yes, we see yes, you. Yes, perfect. Oh, and again, welcome everybody. My name is Antonia Braus. I am veterinarian and desk officer for One Health at Veterinaire Sans Frontières Germany, but at the moment I'm enjoying my maternal leave. And I have the pleasure to guide you through the next 45 minutes. If you don't see the video on full screen, like I do, please click upstairs on event title and a full screen will appear. I really want to highlight and honor the study of four paths and thank all experts who contribute to this important and actual assessment and recommendation. It is really the momentum of rethinking health towards welfare for every habitant and ecosystem of our planet. And all of you are very welcome to take part of this discussion, either via the chat function you find down at your screen. And if everyone is following on Twitter, and would like to submit a question here, please use the hashtag future study so our team can forward the questions to me. So please ask your questions in the chat or via Twitter. Tell us what your name and background is and our colleagues will choose just some of the question later on after the panel discussion. Yeah, and the panel, I'm very excited and delighted to introduce our engaged panelists. As we just heard already, Sira Madad. Sira is based in the US. She's a public health expert with an epidemiologic background, which we just heard. And Sira has been featured in two leading documentaries, such as the Netflix series, How to Prevent an Outbreak, as well the discovery documentary, The Vaccine Conquering COVID. Ich habe gerade, um, we, we're not on air anymore. I just got a message. Um,
can I go on? Is there no, no? Um, no, we need the prompt. Signal. On air. Yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah. So I go further with Mia. Mia McDonald is the executive director and founder of Brighter Green and is based in New York. She's a public policy analyst and consults a very wide range of NGOs. Kurt Schmiedinger is a food scientist, founder of Future Food, and is working right now at the Research Institute for Ethic and Science in dialogue with the University of Vienna. Syrah, Mia, and Kurt were involved as experts in the study. Nina Jamal is the representative of For Path tonight, and she is the international head of farm animals and nutrition campaigns and a pandemic and animal welfare expert. Last but not least, Mark, Mark Jones, he's a British veterinarian with various qualification in aquatic and wild animal health and wildlife rescue and rehabilitation. And since 2014, head of policy at Born Free Foundation. So my first question is, for you, Mark, as a veterinarian with your experience, what would you say, what are the ingredients and habits that takes us from business as usual to a pandemic? What's wrong with the system? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me onto this panel. Thank you to our friends and colleagues at Four Paws for coordinating this really important and timely event. Um, I think the COVID-19 pandemic with all its devastating human and economic consequences seemed to take a lot of decision makers by surprise. Yet while it has arguably been the most devastating of pandemics in recent times, it's by no means the first zoonosis that's developed into a pandemic. And we already knew a fair amount about the likely sources of potential zoonotic viruses and the kinds of circumstances that can lead to their direct or indirect spillover to people before COVID-19 emerged. So the question is, how can the situation have arisen? What should we have done? And what should we do now to prevent something similar or perhaps even worse happening in the future? Um, we're told that there might be 1.7 million viruses circulating in animals and that around half of them could be potentially zoonotic. We're also told that around 70% of all emerging infectious diseases originate from wild animals. So addressing the risks associated with viruses in wild animals would seem to be pretty critical. What we have to remember is that when wild animals are living in their natural environment, in their natural state, the presence of such viruses does not usually lead to clinical disease or significant virus shedding. And the mutation and spillover of these viruses to domestic animals or to people is highly unlikely. It's when we start interacting with and stressing animals that the risks increase. And this can be through the destruction and conversion of habitats, which tends to lead to increases in smaller adaptable species over the larger predators. And these smaller species are often the very species that are most likely to harbor potentially zoonotic pathogens. And it also occurs when animals are captured from the wild or intensively bred, transported for slaughter at markets or in restaurants, often in close proximity to many other animals from many other species, or traded live as pets or photo props more often in more often than not in pretty appalling conditions. And it's in these circumstances, animal welfare will be compromised, their immune systems will be suppressed, and this makes it much more likely that they will contract or shed or amplify pathogens, increasing the risk to other animals and ultimately to people. And I think this combined with increased opportunities for close contact when people are handling animals in, the, in these ways allows viruses to cross over between species and spread and mutate more rapidly. It's worth emphasizing that it's these very same human activities and human, um, and human interactions with wild animals that result in um, that, that are the key drivers, not only of pandemic risk, but also of biodiversity loss. So clearly these are issues we should be addressing if we want to mit mitigate future risk. And for me, the solutions to pandemic risk lie firmly, firmly in changing human behavior 
and understanding, avoiding and mitigating animal welfare harms. This is absolutely key. However, animal welfare is barely featured in high level considerations of pandemic, mis uh, pandemic risk mitigation to date and achieving human behavior change as we all know, on the kind of scale that's required can be very challenging. So I think um, until now, the response to pandemic risk has been largely reactionary. And while there has been a big and necessary focus on scaling up quarantine, vaccine, medical responses, and some effort to research which species might pose the highest risk and in what circumstances going forward, efforts to address the key drivers in, of increased pandemic risk have been much more limited, no doubt reflecting the sort of complex socioeconomic consequences of more radical and precautionary actions and perhaps pressure from vested interests. So I'll finish by saying um, the One Welfare Framework describes the interconnection between animal welfare, human well-being, and their physical and social environment. And its adoption and implementation offers a real holistic approach and a tool to support animal and human pandemic risks mitigation, while also contributing to efforts aimed at addressing well-being in the biodiversity crisis. And it's a concept that we've been promoting strongly through our approach to important international mechanisms like the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework being developed by the Convention on Biological Diversity and the proposed Pandemics Treaty, which is going to be discussed at the World Health Summit in the coming days. Thank you, Mark, so much for this impressive statement. Saira, you are at the front line dealing with pathogen emergency management, public health, with your experience for infectious diseases. What do we need to learn from this pandemic to reduce the risk and all above the impact of future potential ones? Well, I think there's a lot that we can learn from this current situation and how we need to make sure that we're investing in changing um, preparedness and both prevention. And I'm just gonna just very quickly focus on those two terms because they mean very different things. And then I'll just highlight some of the lessons learned from a healthcare public health standpoint and how we really need to change and include better the, the animal and human interface along with uh, our environment. So first, when we talk about preparedness, preparedness is when you know that, that there's an event that's gonna happen and what policies, procedures, what type of resources you have in place to help kind of mitigate and lessen the impact. So it's really important that we continue to focus on preparedness because we know that these events are gonna occur. At the same time, we also need to make sure we prevent them, right? And it's a completely different scope of work. Prevention means that you wanna prevent them from even happening or occurring. And so that's a very separate body of work when we talk about preventing you know, these types of um, incidences and then also preparing for it, knowing that if there is an incident, at least we are better prepared and we can you know, reduce the impact. So as we look at some of the lessons learned, particularly in my experience with COVID-19 and all the different outbreaks that I've responded to, there are some really glaring um, issues and challenges that we have not learned, you know, outbreak after outbreak or pandemic after pandemic. And that is when you look at biopreparedness in a general, you know, realm, it oftentimes only focuses on from a healthcare standpoint, staffing, supply chain, systems, space to accommodate individuals. From a public health standpoint, we're still focused on surveillance and monitoring and community engagement. And all of these things are really important. But the one thing that we often miss, we don't talk much about, is that interface of animals and humans and the ecosystems, the behavioral changes um, and the impact that we have. And if we are to really truly protect human health um, and animal health, we really need to start considering human activities as Mark has mentioned and the behavior that really disrupts our ecosystems and our habitats and things like that. So we really need to make sure that it's also part of the conversation. Um, and so I think just generally, when we look at uh, additional kind of areas for improvement and lessons learned and what we need to do, we really need to make sure that we have those conversations on an ongoing basis. They're part of our public dialogue, a part of our um, advocacy that we do, not just for funding, but also for support. Because if the public doesn't understand the importance of this type of topic, they're not going to advocate for it. They're not going to tell their elected officials, we need to make sure this is on your agenda and invest in it, that we have a policy, we have resources. And I often don't see that when we talk about, you know, the animal and human interface and what we're doing to kind of help combat that. 
The last thing that I'll mention, and Mark really listed out some really great, you know, different contributing factors uh, that we need to look at. The one in my uh, kind of in my uh, in my box that I often you know work on is the mis misuse of antibiotics, and so we really need to make sure that we look at it. Uh, and what we need to do moving forward, because as we look at the next pandemic that we obviously can prevent and we should prepare for, we need to look at the implication of misusing antibiotics and the threat that poses generally to humans and animal health. Thank you, Saya. I think you made that point very clear. Mia, um, within your exp expertise in public policy, in conversation, environmental, animal protection, you have probably thought of all possible factors tied to pandemics and zoonotic disease outbreaks. Can we say that the way we currently treat animals has become an existential threat and why? What needs to be changed here? Thank you so much, Antonia, and, and thanks to my fellow panelists and, and to Four Paws for organizing this. Um, I can't say I've thought of every possibility, but I'll but I'll put forward a couple. And my previous panelists have been have been very succinct and very substantive, so I will try to be the same. Um, I think it's a very interesting question: Has it become existential? And I think I just want to start with the pandemic. And obviously, Syra and others have been very very deeply involved in this on the front lines. Um, I'm here in New York City, and about you know. 12, 14 months ago, this was real epicenter of the COVID crisis uh, in the United States and, and then in the world. And I just checked the data that there have been 240 million global infections of COVID-19 and almost 5 million deaths. And I think many of us, when this first, when we first started hearing about it in China in January, 2020, would never have anticipated how fast and, and quickly this, this virus would have spread and the enormous toll it's taken. So in terms of the existential position we find ourselves in, I would argue that COVID has really illuminated a lot of flaws in how human societies interact with each other, what we value, where there are vast injustices. And it's also really illuminated enormous flaws in our relationship with the non-human world. And so that's where I do think there are existential issues around animal welfare and, and one could even say animal rights in certain ways. Um, so the child, you know, we have we face now so many challenges. We have enormous public health challenges. We have enormous climate challenges, a climate crisis. We have a biodiversity crisis. And if we really look at a lot of the roots of those, it really is a very unfortunate relationship with a non-human world that has been one based on exploitation, uh, disregard, um, uh, massive cruelty in many ways, and not looking at the non-human world as, as a partner in our human endeavor. And as you know, many scientists will remind us, we are part of nature, right? Even if we try to deny that, we are also uh, animals. And so I think the pandemic has really created potentially an inflection point for things to be different. Um, as Syra and Mark also talked about, of course, we need to be trying to prevent pandemics. Yes, we need to be better prepared for the next one of which there probably will be. But the prevention aspect and how that does tie to issues of exploiting animals, wildlife trade, uh, loss of habitat. And again, in my work, a lot of it is in the food system space related to animals and nature. Uh, one of the key drivers of biodiversity loss is agricultural expansion. And a lot of that is really for meat and dairy and feed. And I know Kurt will talk a bit more about that. So I think we have to be grappling with that. That opens up habitats, that opens up uh, interaction between humans and non-humans in ways that really shouldn't be happening and could be the source of more pandemics. Absolutely, the wildlife trade, using animals for meat. We have to be very honest about that and really examine that and find ways to end that practice. Um, even global scientists are telling us we need to move towards more plant-based food systems. UNEP has talked about that. We were part of the UN Food Systems Summit. There is a growing consensus around that, but we need to bring concerns for animal welfare, for environmental uh, sustainability, environmental sanity 
into those discussions. And so we've also talked about antibiotics, certainly uh, issues or, or realities like factory farming, you know, the large scale intensive production of animals for meat um, and dairy that has a huge use of antibiotics. I knew Europe's made some progress on that, but in many parts of the world, including the US, including China, including many other countries, that's a huge source of antibiotic use and then risks of antibiotic resistance. Um, I think we really wanna make sure that we are obviously treating ourselves with respect, but looking at the natural world, not as how can we exploit it for what's really short-term gain, but how can we restore it? How can we uh, look at flashpoints for pandemics and instead of rushing to treat them, how do we prevent them? And I, I do feel like there is more consensus among those in the public health community, those working on environmental and animal welfare issues, as many of us are, um, that we need to grapple with the root causes of the challenges of really life on this planet uh, in, a, in an integrated way. I know we'll talk about that a bit later. So I think it is existential. I think there are ways to really advance human rights, human justice, as well as justice for the non-human world if we look at this with quite granularity, but also a bigger picture and not be so focused on short-term gains. Because as we you know, heard many times now, what is the point of a short-term gain on a planet that is becoming increasingly unlivable, where we have millions of species at risk of extinction and where we have enormous ongoing uh, inequalities in the human community as well. So I think animal welfare can be a real unifying force if we can have some really um, honest and root cause focused conversations as opposed to a flashpoint. I don't think there's really anyone in the world who'd be opposed to animal welfare. I think we have to um, be honest about the economic interests and also really examine what, what the realities around those are, the short-term versus the long-term. So thank you for the question and, and thanks for the panel. Thank you, Mia. If I may add, uh, Antonia, one of the clearest voices that was echoed by a number of experts in the study was about a need for a change in mindset. We need to stop thinking about how everything affects human health, and we need to start thinking about how human behavior affects everything else. And this means that we might need to change the way we define health. We need to change the way we see uh, these interactions, uh, humans, animals, and nature. And um, one of the experts, it was uh, Serge Moran from uh, the University of Montpellier, uh, and he's from the One Health High-Level Expert Panel. He said it very briefly and to the point. He said, we should consider moving from an anthropo anthropocentric vision to an ecocentric vision. And this really resonates. It's something that a number of experts were uh, um, hinting towards. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mia and Nina, for those yeah, insights, suggestions, and recommendations. Mia, yeah, you just uh, mentioned and talked already about agriculture and food systems, and that leads us to our next question to uh, Kurt. Um, yeah, what role have the domestic animals in agriculture and our meat consumption? And could then we know there is a needed reduction and downsizing, but how can we do that? And what would it take? And very important, what does it cost for us? Yeah. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Great um, statement from Mark and Sarah and my, Mia. So lots of things have already been said. Anyway, um, of course, we have to go to the animal agriculture. It's absolutely necessary. We know that uh, in spite of these biosecurity illusion, which we sometimes uh, talked about when industrial livestock um, promoters are talking about industrial livestock factory farms. We know that these facilities are open to virus inputs, can be feed and animals and humans, insects, whatever, bring the virus into these factory farms. 
and then outputs, um, for example, the tons of excrements, which oh, a million tons of excrements coming out of those factory farms, all the animals go out to slaughterhouse or, or, or insects fly out or whatever. So these um, systems are not uh, separated from nature. They, are, they have lots of inputs and outputs. And within those factory farms, we have perfect breeding conditions for new viruses. We have high stocking densities. We have genetically identical animals. We have bad air and hygiene condition. We have stressed animals. And we know that this is all um, leading to, to um, virus modifications. We know studies, for example, from the OIE in 2005 and 2000 to 2007 on H5N1 outbreaks, which showed that the big farms, the industrial farms, are much more likely to be infected by H5N1 than the smaller ones. Even so, sometimes in the discussion, you hear it the other way around. But this is what we really find when we look at it. Um, we know that um, from the actual pandemic, we know that physically distancing helps us to prevent um, or to, to, to deal with a pandemic. What we have in factory farming globally with billions of animals is just the very opposite. We, these animals are forced to do the ultimate opposite of physical distancing. They are super crowded and cramped together. Those are the direct effects which uh, lead um, to, to problems from factory farms. We, we've seen that already. I, I remember at the beginning of November, somebody uh, said, OK, can you prove it? And I said, oh, yeah, it happens all the time. But he, he was very skeptical. And then three days later, the biggest mink industry in the world collapsed from one day to the other. I think organizations like Four Paws tried to for decades to fight this uh, mink industry. And then in, within three days, it was done. It was finished. It was collapsed. So it can be very, very um, rapid in, in factory farms that we have these problems. But it's not just the factory farm itself. It's the whole system. It's the indirect effects. Um, when, we, when we look at what, we, what our area demand as humans, Two-thirds of our area demand, uh, if we exclude forestry, two-thirds of, of our area demand is growing animal, pro producing animal products. And going towards plant-based would mean that we shorten the food chain from the plants to the human and uh, be much more effective uh, with area, uh, much less contact with wild animals um, in areas where humans are new to a higher biodiversity and those are all known as barriers against zoonosis and we also get rid of these wet markets and trade with wild animals and we if we do all of that um, then we are not already on a safe side but pretty much on a safe side uh, to prevent future pandemics um, we could have prevented the epidemics and, and pandemics of in in the past probably including COVID-19 if we, we wouldn't have um, treated animals the way we did. And then another big aspect, Syra already mentioned it, is antibiotics. We use about 70 to 80%. Those are the, the, the estimations um, from 2017, for example, in Ritchie and, and, and some other publications. 70 to 80% of, of the antibiotics we do not use to, to cure human in human medicine, but we use just to run these factory farms, just to put these animals through to make them somehow get alive to the slaughterhouse. That's what we do. And um, this is uh, supposed to increase even in future. And yeah, we, we have to deal with more and more resistant bacteria, resistant against more and more of our antibiotics. And that's another problem. It's not just the viruses. It's also the bacteria and the problems. And this is also um, highly associated with our industrial factory farm systems. And when you um, asked about um, the solutions, <clears throat> we, we have enough food variety to replace um, industrial livestock and to, heavily, to have to a heavy shift towards plant-based. We already have that. Anyway, um, we also have a new plant-based alternatives to meat and eggs and dairy. They are nutritionally not necessary, but I think they are an important step to make this transition more realistic. And if you look a little bit more towards the future, um, we have uh, cellular agriculture, 
uh, cultivated meat, which might also help this um, revolution, getting out of those uh, factory farming system, out of those intensive livestock system. And maybe the use of artificial intelligence for food design and, and many other technologies. And we should really also focus on, on technologies. We should go many ways um, to, to tackle this risk. And last question you had is about the costs. Um, would this also be um, cost effective to, to prevent the future pandemics? And actually, there is a lack in uh, global research on how much uh, transition away from industrial livestock to a more extensive livestock production plus a meat and dairy reduction would on the one hand cost us and on the other hand save us money, save us money in, in hotspots like um, lifestyle diseases or climate crisis or antibiotic resistance or pandemics, we, we, we have the topic today, or also biodiversity loss, just to name a few. So, Doing this um, could um, save more money than um, costing us. And I'm pretty sure that such a purely macroeconomic calculation would come up with um, overwhelming results that a transition towards extensive livestock plus a reduction of, of, of animal products um, would not only be ethically and ecologically uh, making sense, but also economically. And such uh, research would be very essential and funding of this would be very uh, welcome. And that could be a way out of this. Wow, well, yeah. Thank you, Kurt. You, um, yeah, you highlighted the challenges very well, but um, yeah, you presented the solutions here. And I think this is always a, yeah, a positive shift and vibe we yeah we see here and uh, which is so important for all of us and Antonio Mark has his hand up maybe it doesn't ah. on the screen yeah yeah Mark hi ah, yes no it's just a you know I, I absolutely agree with everything Kurt said and the and the, uh, my fellow panelists have said to date um, and I think uh, you know what we often hear is some of the actions that that we might propose that are seen as being uh, highly precautionary by us, perhaps radical by some of those who, who would uh, uh, oppose them, such as moving away from wildlife trade, uh, reducing uh, our reliance on factory farming, moving towards plant-based diets and so forth. Um, we're often told that the socioeconomic consequences are very complicated and, and so forth. And uh, obviously you've got vested interests who, who uh, can put a great deal of pressure on policymakers to, uh, to try and prevent some of these kinds of changes. But as Kurt says, they make good sense, not just from an animal protection or human health perspective, but also good economic sense. And I just wanted to mention that according to a panel of global scientists, if no action is taken, pandemics are going to happen more often, they're going to spread faster, they're going to kill more people than COVID-19, and ultimately they're going to cost the global economy more money. And the panel said that the economic cost of the current pandemic is at least a factor of 100 more than the, the estimated cost of preventing it by protecting nature and by uh, introducing some of these changes that, uh, that Kurtz has uh, outlined. Yeah, thank you, Mark, for this um, addition. And yeah. yeah. If I could add very briefly, uh, Antonia, because I know we still have more questions to get through, but I think there's also this challenge, right, of, of the cost of uh, losing forests, the cost of biodiversity loss, the cost of water scarcity. Those are just not calculated in the, in the standard economic balance sheets. And there's a strong movement to say that that kind of calculation doesn't work anymore because we're all affected by climate change. We're all affected by biodiversity loss. Of course, there are unequal effects of that as well. And there's a lot of injustice. And that's also why a lot of young climate activists are calling for climate justice as well. But it, it is this unfortunate that, oh, we destroyed a forest. That affects weather. That affects habitat. That affects a lot of things that are not in this balance sheet that says, oh, these industries are making money. Really, they aren't. And that, that might be a, a topic for another webinar to delve into that more, but thank you.
Yeah. And um, I also often we put vaccine development versus root causes, we just heard. What should the global health community and decision makers focus on? Mira and um, Maya, you just talked already about preparedness, response and re prevention. Syria, you, if I uh, get it clear, you really see the focus on prevention and how. You have like uh, very practical examples for us here. Yeah, so I think first just um, as you talk about the whole emergency management cycle and you just listed some of the phases, there's five phases, right? So there's prevention, there's mitigation, there's preparedness, there's response and there's recovery. I think there needs to be an emphasis on each one of those phases. It's really important in the body of work that happens in each of them. But as we talk about vaccine production, as we look at, for example, disease X, right? Um, this is a disease that, you know, we um, haven't discovered yet, potentially can have significant implications to human and animal health. And what do we do uh, to prepare for that and prevent, you know, any of the um, impacts that it, it may occur? If we look at vaccine development, and it's been very controversial, even with, for example, in the current environment with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, and just highlighting the fact that, you know, only 6 billion COVID-19 vaccines have been administered around the world, and we're already 10 months into having safe and effective vaccines here in the United States, for example. And so what can we do to better prevent and prepare for these types of incidences? And there's a couple of things I'll just briefly mention. First, as we look at um, preparedness and prevention, we need to have a better catalog of different um, you know, uh, emerging uh, infectious diseases and, and different, for example, pathogens in our environment to know what are we dealing with, right? So there needs to be better systems in place. There needs to be, you know, actively seeking out, you know, some of these pathogens, for example, safely. So that way we can have a catalog of different potential, you know, um, infectious disease threats. And then we need to have a library of prototypes, right? Right now in the current stage, it took about a year, for example, to have safe and effective vaccines here in the United States. We need to slash that time in half because we know that time is of the essence. When you have an outbreak, it can very rapidly spread. And in order for us to prevent the loss of life and, um, and disease and the burden of disease, we need to have safe and effective vaccines. So we need to have a catalog of you know, different uh, you know, pathogens you know, around the world we need to start looking at having prototypes and candidates ready, right? We, may, we, may, we won't have uh, prototypes for every single type of pathogen, but as long as we have a good, you know, uh, you know um, system in place, so we can kind of do a plug and play type of model. And then really importantly, we need to have manufacturing distribution capabilities. So again, highlighting the current situation, COVID-19, how do we hide some of these factories all around the world, we would be able to churn out and produce more vaccines readily for the entire um, you know, population. So when we look at vaccine um, development, there's so much that has to happen, right? Cataloging, developing prototypes and candidates, manufacturing and distribution, all of these things need to really occur in both our preparedness and prevention phases. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, very much on that. Um, Mia, maybe you can give us very briefly um, uh, some uh, examples uh, what it takes to prevent the next pandemic and um, maybe to focus a little bit what are the measures that money alone cannot fix and um, yeah what kind of approach is needed is one health sufficient yeah thanks again for the great discussion and, and the excellent question um, i think in in some we really need more cross-disciplinary policy making and analysis I think that includes public health, environment, uh, animal welfare, and, and we could say sustainability broadly conceived, which would include things like climate and biodiversity and land. I think that sounds daunting, but I actually don't think it is. I think that the UN Environment Program, WHO, you know, the parts of the UN working on the SDGs, many governments actually see these you know, uh, multiple crises they are related and yet they still are largely treated in silos. You know, you're the environment minister, you don't talk to the agriculture minister, you're the public health minister, that's what you're focused on. And I think what COVID has really shaken up is the need to be looking broadly as well as specifically. Um, so I, I think that's really crucial. And the other thing I would just say is, as we've talked about on this panel, One Health, I think is very important. It's obviously a bit better known, 
but I think we should be moving towards a one welfare approach, right? That it that is more inclusive, that is more proactive, that really looks at welfare and well-being of humans and non-humans, and move away from a real anthropocentric approach. We need a more eco-minded, uh, ecocentric way of looking at problems and prevention. And again, the science is showing us we need to do this. It is about money. We do need to shift incentives away from the harms of large-scale animal agriculture, fur farming, mm -hmm. wildlife trade, poaching. But it really is, I think, a mindset that gets translated to policy and worldview. And I think it, it's really, we, you know, we have nine years to save, to save life on this planet in a sustainable way, the scientists are telling us. So we need to be ratcheting this up. And I think COVID, for all of the horror it's created, also provides an opportunity to really Absolutely. bring about some of these changes, including at the World Health Summit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Now, after this great input from you panelists, um, we have a question from the audience. And um, Rai, we receive your questions. Feel free to download the future study of FOPAS, which you find right now in the chat. And um, my first question, which is here, um, I try to sum it up. It's from Marisol Guiteres. Um, yeah, to sum it up, why does politics allow those risk food systems? Why is it still, yeah, we, we, we know so many restrictions from policy. Why, 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 why this danger systems are still on air? Maybe a Justin, very short, very briefly. Um, first of all, tradition, which uh, keeps people from moving away to more sustainable food systems. And on the other hand, it's lobbying and, and money transfer to, to politics, I think, as well. So that's also a big issue because these industries are currently very strong and therefore their influence on politics are very strong. You can see it, for example, when you have these um, in the European Union, for example, when we had this discussion, if, we, if you can uh, call meat alternatives, plant-based meat, meat alternatives, if you can call them burgers or if you do not can cannot call them or if um laws are made to prevent that we show um the reality of what is happening in factory farms to public and people are arrested for that for for this kind of undercover journalism investigation so it's not not that that the animal welfare breaches are chased but but just in the opposite um that some, somebody who exposes this um is um affected that's that's the current situation nevertheless i'm optimistic because we have these um we have these innovations and we have the big players in food industry also on board on our board they they are working on on the shift towards plant-based and also towards cellular agriculture so i'm i'm pretty optimistic and if we don't make it uh with um science or if we don't make it with um yeah ethics, then we, we are forced by catastrophes, and I think we should avoid that. Yeah, thank you, Kurt. And yeah, we just heard in a few days the Global Health Community are meeting at the World Health Summit and discuss about the biggest challenges tied to human health. What would be your message or a brief statement to the audience there? Um, Maybe, Sira, you may start. So my top line message is that we obviously need to look at the intimate linkage, you know, between health of humans, animals, ecosystems, into biopreparedness and, you know, bioprevention. Right now, uh, those are bottom level topics. The top line topics have always been, again, healthcare wise, staffing, stuff, space, supply chain, public health, surveillance, monitoring and the like. And unfortunately, animal welfare and the interaction in human behavior um, and the impact is often an afterthought. So we need to do better and having that as a single point of significant discussion as we move forward and building more robust and sustainable policies um, moving forward. Thank you, Sarah. Mia, what would your statement be? 
Well, I would thank the delegates for meeting and for really grappling with some of these really urgent and tough issues. But I would say I would really ask for focus on preventing as well as um, treating pandemics, being prepared for pandemics, as, as my colleagues have said. I'd also really urge focus on cross-disciplinary policy making, getting out of silos. How can public health engage um, with other, uh, you know, crucial sectors, environment, climate, biodiversity, um, and also this shift in mindset away from a real exploitation of the non-human world to how can we live in a more mutual way, and also to envision the future that that could create, which could be so much better for humans and non-humans to end some of this exploitation and extraction and real suffering that COVID has led to, you know, to, to be hugely honest about that. It's been, it's been a huge toll for the planet. So I think to look to the future with concrete, but also quite an ambitious mindset and have one welfare be on um, their set of discussions as well. I would strongly encourage that. Thank you. Thank you, Mia. Good. what is your message? My message would be that instead of just treating the symptoms of pandemics and ignoring the threat of the end of the antibiotic era, we must go to the core of all these troubles and some other troubles, including, for example, climate crisis. And we must bring industrial livestock into the focus. Uh, we must make an end to its inefficient use of plant calories and of land and its inherent cruelty and risks. And to put it short, we have to make an end to industrial livestock. Yeah, absolutely. And Mark, what are your findings? Well, the, the disadvantage of, of going last on this round is that I think my fellow panelists have probably said most of, uh, of what there is to be said in, in that kind of summary form. I mean, I think, so I'll be repeating some of what's been said already. When it comes to pandemic risk, uh, preparedness is important, but prevention has to be prioritised. Um, I think a transformative and highly precautionary approach to risk is warranted in order to reduce pandemic risk and to tackle the biodiversity and, by extension, the climate crisis. We need to focus on changing our relationship with wild animals and wild places through the adoption of a one welfare approach and the mainstreaming of animal welfare and protection and wild, wild uh, habitat protection into policy. And um, as has been said, a truly interdis interdisciplinary approach is going to be vital if we're going to avoid another COVID-19. The institutions and experts in human health, animal health and welfare, conservation, environmental issues, socioeconomics and so on, need to be communicating effectively with each other and working together. Oh, thank you, Mark. And Nina, um, your closing also as the voice of four paths here. What is your statement? Thank you, Antonia. Thank you, everyone. So our statement from Four Paws is, it took a pandemic and global tragedy to get us to this moment. This challenge is a global one and it needs a global response. So dear policymakers, we need a pandemic treaty. Don't just prepare, prevent. Pandemics are human driven. We must tackle the root causes, put our relationship to animals at the center of the international policy and health agenda. It's better for humans, animals, and nature. And it costs a fraction of what this pandemic has cost in lives and money. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, a big, big thank you of all of you for your smart, important assessments, questions, recommendations, finding, and demands. And under the same link of this event tonight, you find tomorrow the study for downloading and also the record of our evening and our event tonight. I assume all of us here in this Zoom meeting, in this virtual room, we can all contribute, not only to discuss One Health, One Welfare, we can live and implement this in discipline goal for all of us. Thank you one more last time and have a great evening and goodbye. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.